Uh, Kira Tata, everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrells, my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Emeritus Professor Chris Dorick, who uh, was the head of general practice in Liverpool for many years. And uh, he's the past chair of the World uh, Organization of Family Doctors, Wonka, uh, a working party for mental health, uh, which provided expert advice to WHO. Um, he's enabled education interventions for family doctors in Europe, Asia, and leads an initiative to expand the advocacy skills of family doctors in primary mental health care. Um, his research portfolio covers mental health problems in primary care with a focus on depression and medically unexplained symptoms. Uh, he, he critiques contemporary emphases on unitary diagnostic categories and medically oriented interventions and highlights the need for socially oriented perspectives. He has developed mental health care for the marginalized communities, including asylum seekers and refugees. And he's published a number of books, including the one that we're talking about tonight, which is Reading to Stay Alive, which is on the screen at the moment. Uh, the one I'm more familiar with is his book, Beyond Depression, a new approach to understanding and managing uh, depression which is, takes a very unique biopsychosocial approach to, to um, depression. Chris is a very interesting colleague. He is hugely well known in the United Kingdom. And when you go to a conference and you see a talk by Chris Dorick, it's usually got a really unusual angle, a little bit like this webinar tonight. And there's just a crowd of people there. You have to get there early if you want to see Chris talk at a conference. Uh, he has a very big following there. Um, he intends to under, uh, expand our understanding on the recursive relationship between literature and mental health and the potential for literary reading to broaden our approach to suicide prevention. So Chris, thank you very much. Uh, Chris is joining us from Spain at the moment. He's on vacation. So we're very pleased that you've uh, being able to dial in for our broadcast tonight, Chris. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, I hope you can see me and hear me okay. Uh, I'm actually on, on the veranda of our house in Spain and there's, there's quite a gale blowing. We've had, we've had the first rain here that, that, that we've had for several months. So if, if there's any problems with sound, let me know, but otherwise I shall, I shall just carry on. So, Thank you for that very, very wonderful introduction. And so what I, what I want to talk about today uh, is, is my latest book, Reading to Stay Alive, which is exploring how, how literary reading can enable people considering suicide to stay alive. Uh, as Bruce says, I'm, I'm an academic GP with an interest in mental health. And, and I'm, I'm grounding this book in, in, in the lived experience of patients intertwined with perspectives from social psychology and moral philosophy and then the recursively in, in, in involving those with, with reflective descriptions of particularly my encounters with Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which I'm going to talk about a bit more in a few minutes, and, and, and the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. But the, the basis of, of where I'm coming from is, 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 is a view about the key elements of literary reading. Uh, my colleague Josie Billington, who's an English professor in Liverpool, uh, writes about the ability of literature to hold thoughts which humans feel it would almost kill themselves to contain in themselves, to acknowledge the deeply unconsolable and to think reality when ordinary human thought falls short. In other words, that books can have thoughts that humans simply cannot have. And then uh, Andrew Bennett, who's another literary uh, professor in, in Bristol in England, writes about literature having a particular status since in its engagement with the inadmissible, it allows for the possibility of imagining suicide and feeling empathy towards individuals who undertake it. So where I'm coming from is literary reading enables us to give voice to thoughts and experiences that would otherwise be too difficult to contemplate. It offers a safe psychological distance, partly because it's other, and partly because we can exercise control and agency over it. If we can read it, we can more readily endure it. 
if we can come face to face with the darkest elements of our lives, we can look them squarely in the eye and refuse to be defeated. Now, before engaging directly with, with the literary text in the book, I consider a range of sociological, psychological and anthropological perspectives, which, which can inform our literary reading. Um, I'm not going to go into these in any detail, and we can pick them up afterwards if you want. But the 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 the, the, uh, the two I'm, I'm most interested in are, are, are Joiner's interpersonal theory, with with the key key elements of thwarted belongingness, burdensomeness, and the capability to act on suicidal thoughts, and then Rory O'Connor's integrated motivational volitional model with with its focus on defeat and entrapment. And I, I, I undertake in one of the chapters a detailed analysis of the, the turmoil and despair Gerard Manley Hopkins works through in his so-called terrible sonnets. Created during a deeply unhappy period of his life, these six poems, the six poems arise from what he calls a languishment of body and mind. But they also give their readers, including me and my patient Francis, glimpses of his unimpeachable honesty, rich authentic descriptions of the deepest distress, cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer no man fathoms, and a sense of connection of, of shared experience. They encourage us to observe our emotions rather than be overwhelmed by them, to survive come what may, to not choose not to be, and to nurture the flowering of self-compassion leaving comfort root room. In, a, in, a, in another chapter, uh, reflecting more widely on literature that's transformed my personal understanding of suicide, uh, I, I start with James Joyce and his portrayal of suicide as an everyday experience, an everyday temptation. I discuss Al Alvarez's ambivalence towards the act and his conclusion that it's nothing more than a denial of experience. And with the poet Peter Porter, I reflect on the cost of seriousness and consider what other options there may be when life seems too difficult to continue. Perhaps the gritty endurance of the poet Stevie Smith, uh, perhaps the political awareness of, uh, speak me of Herbert and Seamus Heaney, or perhaps the creative fiction of Nick Hornby and Matt Haig. And then with reference to the American writer David Foster Wallace, I discuss the inexplicability of suicide to those bereft by it and consider with, with the help of Graham Swift and Maggie O'Farrell, how new ways of living may emerge for those of us who are left behind. And then finally, in this chapter, traveling back in time from North London in the 21st century through 10th century Iceland to ancient Egypt, I show how support from those close to us or from people we meet by accident can make the difference between death and life. And then I, 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 I have a philosophical chapter, I love philosophy, so bringing philosophical perspectives to bear, I, I support the views of Schopenhauer and Spinoza, that we have an innate will to life, a desire to persevere in our own existences, which can carry us through tough times, especially when our own suffering creates a sense of compassion for the distress of others. And when our sense of coherence is threatened, <clears throat> our intersubjective engagement with others, whether in the form of moral communities or webs of inter interlocution can be powerful antidotes to despair. And we may find with Camus that acknowledging the absurdity of life generates in us an energetic spirit of revolt passion and freedom. But I, I want to focus now for, for the next few minutes on Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. <clears throat> All four of the main characters in this epic novel, that's Kitty, Vronsky, uh, Anna and Levin, at various times are faced with the question of whether or not they wish to stay alive. And I'm gonna focus within here on Anna, and resonance with my patient Charlie, and then on, by contrast, on, on Levin, who really is Tolstoy's alter ego. 
to Anna. <clears throat> After Anna elopes with Vronsky, leaving behind her son, her life crumbles around her. Socially, she finds herself isolated and ostracized. Her boredom and her dependence on Vronsky engender bitterness and cause the couple to argue endlessly. She becomes pathologically jealous, accusing him of multiple affairs, and she turns to morphine to help her sleep. Anna and Vronsky discuss returning from Moscow to their country estate where they were happier, but she hesitates, uncertain of his motives, and they launch into their final argument. Anna's last words to him, you, you will regret this, are seen by Vronsky as an improper, irritating threat. He decides to pay no attention and goes to visit his mother. And they then follow what for me are some of the most remarkable pages in modern literature. A lot of resonance both with James Joyce and with Virginia Woolf as we witness Anna's last few hours of life through her stream of complicated, contradictory, and ultimately self-destructive consciousness. For me, this text is the most compelling and authentic literary example of what Al Alvarez described as the shabby, confused, agonized crisis, which is the common reality of suicide. It's compulsive, and I would suggest compulsory reading for anyone wishing to understand the experience of another human being in deepest distress. It's, it's the passage that prompted me to, to, to write this book. Moment to moment, she oscillates between hope and despair. She sees a funny hairdresser sign and thinks she'll share a laugh about it with Bronsky, but then realizes she may never see him again. The zest has gone, she says to herself. At the station, everyone looks ugly or stupid. If, if, just in passing, if, if you were looking, you had a chance to look at that clip of Kira Knightley, that's, that's this little bit here that, that, that that's concentrating on. She's irritated by the superficial conversation of her husband and wife. Bronsky isn't there and, and she rejects his careless final note, thinking to herself, no, I will not let you talk to me. Everyone on the platform seems to be talking about her or looking at her, so she moves along to get away from them. And once again, death seems to be the answer. In phrasing reminiscent of Macbeth's final soliloquy, she asks herself, why not put out the candle if there's nothing more to look at? If everything is repulsive to look at, it's, it's all untrue, it's all lies, all deception, all evil. And then suddenly, Remembering the man who'd been run over the day she first met Bronsky, she realized what she had to do. She walks to the end of the platform, down the stairs to the railway track, stopping close to a passing goods train and estimates the midpoint between the front and back wheels. There, she says, into the very middle and I shall punish him and escape from everybody and myself. It's important to point out that escape from is only one possible translation of this key phrase. It fits well with the sense of punishment for its urgency and resentment. But Tolstoy's root verb also translates as to be saved from or be rid of, reflecting Anna's desperate desperation to vacate her situation and her tragic evasiveness. And from the related noun, there's also the translation deliverance which when linked with saved allows the inclusion of an oblique uh, religious meaning to her last few words. And then we're into the final paragraph, which is one of the things I sent around before the talk. So I'm going to read this out. This is from the Maud translation of, uh, of Tolstoy's novel. She wanted to fall halfway between the wheels of the front truck, which was, which was drawing level with her, but the little red handbag which she began to take off her arm delayed her, and then it was too late. The middle had passed her. She was obliged to wait for the next truck. 
a feeling seized her like that she'd experienced when preparing to enter the water in bathing, and she crossed herself. And the familiar gesture of making the sign of the cross called up a whole series of girlish and childhood memories, and suddenly the darkness that obscured everything for her broke, and life showed itself to her for an instant with all its bright past joys. But she did not take her eyes off the wheel of the approaching second truck. And at the very moment when the midway point between the two wheels drew level, she threw away her red bag and drawing her head down between her shoulders, she threw herself forward on her hands under the truck. And with a light movement, as if preparing to rise again, immediately dropped to her knees. And at the same moment, she was horror struck by what she was doing. Where am I? What am I doing? Why? She wished to rise, to throw herself back, but something huge and relentless struck her on the head and dragged her down. God, God, forgive me everything, she said, feeling the impossibility of struggling. And the candle, by the light of which she'd been reading that book filled with anxieties, deceptions, grief and evil, flared up with a brighter light, lit up for her all that had before been dark, crackled, began to flicker, and went out forever. My principal reflection at this point is that Anna's suicide was not inevitable, but almost casual. Although the world was closing in on her, although everything and everybody seemed vile, it could have been averted. Just because it did happen, it doesn't follow that it had to happen. There were choices and contingencies right up to the last few seconds of her life. If Vronsky had received her first message sooner and responded differently, if the irritating couple hadn't entered the railway carriage, if the people standing on the platform hadn't critically commented on her costume, forcing her to walk to the end of the platform, it was only in those last few moments that she realized what she must do. For me as a clinician and as a human being, Tolstoy's message is critical. Even in the most desperate of circumstances, even if we're convinced that the whole world is against us, until that very moment when the train actually, when the train actually rolls over us, the possibility of hope remains. And this thought gives me solace when I reflect on the life and death of my patient, Charlie. It's not her real name. She used to be the singer in the band, and she felt beautiful then. But for many years, she suffered from chronically low self-esteem, continually reinforced by long-term abuse from her ex-partner. Recently, she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer secondaries in her spine. With her consequent anxiety and depression, self-treated but also exacerbated by alcohol, led her to take several overdoses. Her attempts to start a new life for herself, with the support of many good friends, were frustrated by forced isolation during the first major lockdown of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fear and loneliness become too much for her. She takes another overdose, survives it, but keeps on drinking. She reaches out to her son in the hope of a few seconds conversation with her beloved granddaughter, Tammy, but her son decides to block her call. She can no longer find any reasons to stay alive. Her hope is extinguished and two days later, she's dead. Like Anna, Charlie was at very high risk of suicide. Her belongingness to her life, so others, especially her granddaughter, Tammy, now seemed to her to be entirely thwarted. She felt lonely and disconnected in the absence of any recipro reciprocally caring relationships. She felt defeated, humiliated and trapped with no possibility of escape or rescue. Her chronically low self-confidence meant she was too easily assumed herself to be a burden to the many people who reached out to offer her care and support and left and, and that left her with little belief in the possibility of solving her problems. 
the previous evidence has demonstrated a capability for suicide, her ability to tolerate the related fear and pain. She had the strain of being unable to, to find the coping skills to address the, the crises engulfing her. And her sense of safety was overwhelmed by the multiple threats to her existence. And there was nowhere perhaps other than the bottle bottle where she even momentarily felt safe. So we might assume as with Anna that her tragic end was inevitable, but the constellation of adverse circumstances meant Charlie's death was one way or, or another imminent. And it's true that the advanced nature of her cancer meant her life would be foreshortened. Yet the timing and the manner of her passing could so easily have been different. If the pandemic had not forced her into complete isolation, away from the comfort, the therapeutic comfort of her friends. If her son had not refused contact, even a few minutes on Zoom with her beloved granddaughter, she might have found the grace to stay alive and to keep her flame of hope alight. Now, staying with Anna Karenina, but uh, moving now to, 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 to Levin, who is, as I say, Tolstoy's alter ego. Levin faces none of the dilemmas of existence that overwhelm Anna. His roles in life as a man, as an aristocratic landowner, as husband to Kitty and father of many children are socially accepted and unimpeded. He experiences no sense of shame in his social relations. He's able to love his wife, his family and his children without compromise, secrecy, or ambiguity. Hang on a second, I'm just going to close the door, just a second. Okay, back again. He's confronted with no impossible choices about whom he should spend his time with. He experiences no stigma, no external pressures to behave differently, no humiliation. His belongingness is not thwarted, he doesn't perceive himself to be a burden to those around him. He's neither trapped nor defeated. Yet we find Levin in the final chapters of the novel in the depths of despair. Although he was a happy and healthy family man, Tolstoy writes, Levin was several times so near to suicide that he hid a cord he had lest he should hang himself. And he feared to carry a gun lest he should shoot himself. The dilemma of existence for Levin, as for Tolstoy himself, was profound existential uncertainty. He's horrified not so much of death than by life without the least knowledge of whence it came, what it's for, why and what it is. His attempts to replace his childhood religious faith with modern ideas of science and philosophy feel like a person who's exchanged a thick fur coat for muslin garments and who being out in the frost for the first time becomes clearly convinced, not by arguments, but with the whole of his being, that he's as good as naked and that he must inevitably perish miserably. And at this point, Levin's subjective experiences, albeit derived from radically different causes, begin to mirror those of Anna. He feels the cruel mockery of some evil and offensive power. He's in painful discord with himself. Without knowing what I am and why I'm here, it's impossible for me to live, and I cannot know that, therefore I cannot live. He had either to explain his life so that it didn't, did not look like the wicked mockery of some devil, or shoot himself. And in such moments, both Anna and Levin are deeply conflicted, with no sense of the safety or reality of their being in the world, and hence utterly alone. As, as Richard Pevere observes, Metaphysical solitude is the hidden connection between them and is what connects them both to the author. But unlike Anna, Levin did not hang himself or shoot himself, and he went on living. And there seem to me to be two separate though interrelated dimensions to Levin's at times highly precarious ability to avoid killing himself and to carry on living. And in considering that the fundamental questions behind my book, which is whether literary reading can help people considering suicide to stay alive. I suggest that both of these are important. Either may be sufficient, but only the first is strictly necessary. 
the, the first way in which Levin is able to stay alive is by doing rather than thinking. Tolstoy writes, when Levin thought about what he was and why he lived, he could find no answer and was driven to despair. But when he left off asking himself these questions, he seemed to know what he was and why, and why lived. And he acted and lived unfortunately and definitely. And for me, the crucial phrase here is when he left off asking himself these questions. His endless ruminations, however erudite they may be, are getting him nowhere except to dig himself deeper and deeper into the well of his despair. Instead, just focusing on the busyness of everyday life is what gets him through. He's able to work through his suicidal impulses by active, wholehearted engagement in his customary pursuits. He becomes occupied by managing his estates, by the hard physical activity of cultivating his own land, cutting deeper and deeper into the soil, by his passion for beekeeping, his conversations with peasants, neighbors and visiting relatives, his daily interactions with his household and family, and his concerns about his wife Kitty and their new baby being in danger from a storm damaged oak tree. It's worth noting that this approach to managing distress, this focus on activity rather than cognition, is the basis of the therapeutic intervention known as behavioral activation. It's an approach that aims to increase engagement in adaptive activities, especially those associated with the experience of pleasure or achievement and to solve problems in a rewarding way. The second dimension to, to, to Levin or Tolstoy's survival is an emergent spiritual understanding. This begins with his realization that reasoning is of no help to him at all, but that if he stops thinking and simply lives, he finds a moral purpose to, or judgment to guide his actions. This is Tolstoy again. But when he did think, when, sorry, when he did not think, but just lived, he unceasingly felt in his soul the presence of an infallible judge deciding which of two possible actions was the better and which the worse. And as soon as he did what he should not, what he should not have done, he immediately felt this. Knowledge, knowledge of what is good cannot be explained by reason, he decides. Goodness sits outside the, the chain of cause and effect. He understands that his life was good, but his thinking was bad. And then his conversation with a religious peasant produces, like Paul on the road to Damascus, the effect of an electric spark. The point of his, of his existence is to serve the good, to live not for one's needs, but for God. But before he can formulate the answer to what exactly his revelation may be, or explain the unquestionable meaning of the good, he finds himself busy in the nursery with Kitty, discussing washstands and attending to the needs of their baby. So for present, for present purposes, this is a sufficient resolution. For Tolstoy himself, seeking to do good in the world is what gives him meaning, overcomes his despair, addresses his dilemma of existence, and gives him reasons to live. So in, in conclusion, now, I, I believe that literary reading enters the confusing and chaotic heart of the suicidal experience in ways that even the profoundest theoretical insights are simply unable to do. Engaging with Tolstoy or Hopkins or so many others, we're transported to places which are simultaneously real and not real, with a combination of the otherness and brilliance of the text allows us the space and gives us the courage to acknowledge the deeply unconsolable, to engage with the inadmissible, to hold thoughts and experience emotions which we would otherwise fear it would almost kill us to contain. For those considering suicide, literary reading provides an awareness that we're not alone, which can be of great significance given the intense sense of isolation and alienation that often form part of the suicidal experience. It provides opportunities to exercise self-compassion and self-forgiveness, and it offers alternative scenarios and solutions to the dilemma of our existence. And for those of us caring for people considering suicide, whether it's family, friends, or health professionals, literary reading can extend our sense of compassion. It allows us the possibility of 
imagining suicide and feeling empathy towards individuals who want to take it. It enables us to overcome that first, sometimes immense hurdle, composed of a combination of egocentricity, uncertainty, confusion and dread, which closes off compassion and stops us from being healers. We can become more able to turn towards suffering, become more curious about the person's experience and intentionally become more present and engaged. With the result that we can simply and crucially sit with and listen to the person in despair. Bearing witness to suffering, giving the other a sense of being understood and accepted is the first essential step towards hope. Thank you. Okay, well, that was pretty, um, pretty uh, deep and intense, Chris. So yes, yes. with your patient, Charlie, what would yep. you do differently now? Um, you've done this reading um, and you've read Tolstoy. Could you imagine giving her that chapter? Would that be an option? Or would that be a guided reading, perhaps? I think I, I, I think the state she was in that I mean as you know it's it's I I I think I think there are other readings that I I, I could have given her which which are a bit more readily accessible um, when you're in in uh, in very deep distress I I, I, I for me sort of reading Tolstoy is something that um, as, as as someone providing care or at, at a different stage in her life might well have been but, but at, at the stage at the stage in those last few weeks I think um, I would most likely have offered her a suggestion of reading a book called called uh, called the Midnight Library by Matt Haig uh, which right. is uh, Matt Haig H A I G which is um, a, a very accessible story about, about a young woman um, in not the same, but not the similar circumstances to Charlie, who, who kills herself and then finds herself in a midnight library where she's uh, a, a, a guy that offers her a chance to, to, to re relive her life in, in multiple different ways. Um, it's, it's just a way of sort of exploring the the choices, the choices that we have, even even in despair, I think that might be more accessible. I noticed a couple of things you said. There were bearing witness to suffering was yes. one thing, and I guess that issue of bringing in uh, encouraging self compassion, which is often missing in our patients. Uh, I'd say yes. about a third of the distressed people I'd see when I ask them if they can show kindness to themselves. But they can show others. They say they can't do that. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean. Charlie was a case in point. She was, she was very compassionate towards other people. Yes, but much, much less so to herself. Yeah. yeah. There's a nice line from Kelly Wilson, one of the ACT developers. He says, "Imagine you're looking into the eyes of somebody you love with all your heart. What would you do with them? How would you be with them?" Yeah. And now imagine yeah. the more difficult thing. Imagine you're looking into your own eyes. And when I say that to people, I call it the stall button test. If they go, no, I can't do that. You know, yeah. you know, there's a problem with, with self-compassion. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. You're absolutely right, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I've just got to just going to make that just ask the audience, if you want to ask questions of Chris, please put them into the QA box. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. So um so what would you do differently now that you've read this book, Chris? What would be your advice for us in dealing? I mean, I have a colleague who works in a children's hospital here. She's a psychiatrist. She says everybody who comes into their ward is suicidal. They discharge them suicidal, um, yep. you know, um, because they can't keep them in hospital forever, basically. Um, so what do we do with our chronically suicidal patients? What have you learned from what you've done? 
I think no, it's it's going to vary from person to person. I, I think I think <clears throat> if I, could, I I'm not answering this directly, but I I I I, I have another patient I've known for many years who I would describe as chronically suicidal. But but for her, knowing I mean, she. She, she always has a store of um, um, sleeping pills or whatever in the house in, in, her, in her medicine cabinet. Um, and, and, and this is also um, linking in with, with the poet Stevie Smith, who I mentioned, who, who I, I spent quite a lot of time writing about in one of the chapters. Sometimes knowing that you can kill yourself at any point actually enables you to keep going. Oh. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but that's oh. that's certainly been my experience. With, 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 as it was certainly Stevie Smith wrote about that as often this with this other patient that I'm, that I'm, I'm thinking about. That's that's so for her as well. N knowing that she has the option to bail out at any time and she's got the means and, and whatever, it it, 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 it enables us, okay, well I'll I'll give it another day, I'll give it another week and whatever and, and see what happens. So I think there's oh. that. But I think in it, in it, but also, I mean, there are other patients who, I mean, I think part of, part of the compassion is to say, and I've said this to a number of people, yeah, I can understand it. Your life is just crap. Oh. It's just awful. Oh. Uh, I, I hope you'll stay alive, but if you don't, yes, I, I say two things. If you don't, I will understand. I also, and I, and I, I also say I, I, I wouldn't be angry with you. Um, uh, oh. So I, I think it's, and I think that's some people nice think that, I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah. But that it's. I mean, some people may think that's a bit dodgy because it's giving people permission. But at the same time, I don't think it is because I, I, will, I mean, you have to judge who you're saying things to. But I think um, it's because I, I mean, as we know, for, for for many people, life for all sorts of reasons is is close to unbearably awful, and 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 I. I hope, I believe that just uh, hearing that, sharing it, acknowledging it, uh, give, gives people a chance to just to keep going that little bit longer. And I, I had a journey. Sorry. 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 Yeah, and I, I'm coming, coming back to that. But for me, there's lots of, but I mean, reading stuff like Anna Karenina, reading stuff like Stevie Smith, reading stuff like, like Tolstoy. Expands my expands my, my expands my, my ability to, to my ability to be compassionate and, and, and you know to sort of to oh, to, oh. to 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 allow myself to, to hear uh, and and experience that precarious suffering without being without being overwhelmed by it. I uh, I had a German doctor in one of my training courses once, and he said his supervisor in Germany used to say to patients, I don't want to lose you, which I thought yes. was a nice, uh, yes. it sort of personalizes it, but you've got a bit of skin in the game too. Yes. And um, yes. I think yes, that's, yes, yes. Um, and there's another one from Russ Harris, who's an ACT trainer in Australia, British GP, who does acceptance and commitment therapy. And he says, there's part of you that doesn't want to kill yourself. That's the bit I'd like to work with at the moment. Which yes. I think is another yes, nice one yes. because it's yes. sort of um, uh, it gets that functional part because there's a lot of dysfunctional thinking I think with suicidal thoughts, isn't there? Yes, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, and that's and that's it. If, if you're going, going back to that text I was reading or commenting on about Anna Karenina and stuff, that there were many moments that you know, if somebody had sat there and said that to her, you know, if, yes. if the people in the railway carriage or whatever, yeah, I mean things could have and very very probably would have been very different. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So you can. I'm, I'm confident that you can say things and, and mean things that actually make make a difference to people in those circumstances. So we've got a questionnaire from an anonymous attender. Prof, any suggestions of suitable reading material for a young young person who's uh, suicidal, attempted several several times but never succeeded yet? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I I I. I I think over time we, we we all find texts that work for ourselves. I, I would go back how, how, for, for a young person. I think Matt 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 Haig H A I G is a very accessible writer. 
I, men I mentioned his book, <coughs> uh, his novel Midnight Library. He's also he's also written a book called Reasons to Stay yes. Alive. Yes, I've heard him. He's been inter in interviewed on national radio here about yes, five and, years and ago. He's, he wrote that fabulous book, wasn't yeah, it? And, 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 and he, he's wonderful because I mean he's been there. He's done it. He's he's been very close to suicide. But but his work is here, and and, and that, that that's I I'd, I'd probably start I'd probably start with that with that one. I'd probably start with reasons to stay alive because it's yeah. it's absolutely it's absolutely crunchy and in there. Yeah. 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 No, that they they're great um, great suggestions. So um, I'll just write that in the um, in the in the the chat box. Now it's interesting what you said about behavioural activation because. Yep. Interestingly, that's the most effective treatment for low mood. Um, numbers yes, is treated yes. two point five on David Eckes' yes. review of a few years ago, and um, I very much encourage that before antidepressants um, because yes, absolutely because, um, right. Yes, yes. Yeah. As yeah, you say, it gets people back in touch with the sort of positive reinforces in their environment, which they've lost yeah. contact with, haven't they? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, I mean, I mean, that, that's exactly. I mean, I, I, the Tolstoy's sort of spiritual bit I can take or leave, but it's there in the novel. But but the the, the behavioural activation bit that, that that's I mean that, that uh, he absolutely was doing that himself without without seeing any therapists or GPs or anybody. He was he worked that out for himself. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I call it the dashboard warning light. My one is when I don't want to go to the gym and do exercise. I now know to go to the gym and do exercise, and I immediately feel better. You know, yes, yes, just makes yeah. me feel better every time. Yeah. And because um, yeah. there's all sorts of things happening there, it's social, it's exercise. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're in a different place. Um, yeah. I don't go to a very big glamorous gym, but um, it's uh, it's it does make me feel better every time. So these are yeah. Uh, so it's Matt Haig, H A I G H, isn't it? I think. H A I G. H I G, yeah. Okay. H, H A I G. There's no H and, on the end. And he wrote Midnight it's, it's, Library as well, did he? Yes, he did. Yes, yeah. Okay, I'll just put uh, that and in. He, he's, he, he's, on, uh, he's on social media a lot as well. So, I mean, he, he's a good person to follow. Yeah. yeah. Um, just if you've got any more questions, put them into the QA box. Um, anything else there, Chris, that you'd like to sort of um, emphasize from your talk? Well, I, I, I think, I, I, mean, I mean, there's so many bits. I, I, I mean, for me, the, the most important bit was what I was reflecting on, on the, Anna Karenin and on, and on Charlie, that, that suicide until it has actually happened is never inevitable. That yes. I, I would say and that that's both for people who are uh, who, who are questioning whether it's worth staying alive and, and people who are caring for such people. It, it's never, you know, there, there, there are always things that you can consider or do differently. And so, so, and so, but I think if I'm talking to a group of people who are you know, sort of in the caring profession, I think that's the most important thing you know, that you don't ever you don't ever have to give up on 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 working with caring for thinking of thinking about how how things might just be different because there's another side to that isn't that i mean we all sort of beat ourselves up when a patient takes their lives and i yeah. think other things sometimes happen i had a woman i saw when i was working in canada and i prescribed her amitriptyline late in the day this was before fluoxetine was available and I got yeah. called to the emergency room the next day. We, it was a little town, a rural town in Canada. And the nurse says, Mrs. Smith's here. She's overdosed on her amitriptyline. Yeah. And I immediately yeah. knew it was my amitriptyline. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I just remember this sinking feeling in my gut that she yeah. had potentially, well, I didn't know that she would stay alive, but um, she had potentially tried to kill herself with my medication. Um, yeah. Anyway, so we, we took the pills out of the stomach as, as how we did in the old days. And of course, you see, a lot of us in cities don't have that experience. You know, somebody else picks it up. You know, somebody else deals with the overdose and we hear about it. But here I was having to sort of deal with my own situation. And yeah. um, I talked to her and I said, well, look, you know, 
I did check if he was suicidal. She said, no, you did. And I wasn't suicidal, but I went home. My husband beat me up and I decided life wasn't worth living. Yeah. And so, you know, if she had killed herself, I never would have known that. But actually, something major in her life. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, that, yes, yes. So she, she sort of, <laughs> she, she enabled you to forgive yourself in some ways then. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think in a sense, and we have to learn to do that to carry on as doctors, I think, because yes, do. yeah. it does, yeah. um, as my colleague who works in the child psychiatric unit, there are no winners when somebody commits suicide. Yeah. No winners, basically. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's, um, yeah. everybody's flattened by it, really. Yeah. So, Chris, we don't have any further questions. Okay. So what I might do is draw this to a close and let you That's fine. get back to your day. And thank you very much. Um, Ali Albia said, thank you. Great talk. So, and I, I think that was amazing, Chris. Very, very true to, um, true to your style. And um, <laughs> thank you. Good Bruce. luck with the book. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, okay. everybody.